Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown, and I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft. Hi. And Garrick Jones. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by Amy Brown. Amy is an author, consultant, and global speaker. Uh, and as the founder of Synaptic Potential, through which she works with companies including Warner Brothers, EMY, Twinnings, uh, the NHS and Mondelez International to help them to better understand teams, clients and organisations as a whole. Her books are Make Your Brain Work, uh, Engaged and Neuroscience for Coaches. Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, Amy. Thank you. It's great to have you here. So I understand, Amy, that you studied medicine at UCL uh, before you moved into the developing field of neuroscience, uh, and then you became a pioneer in the application of this cutting-edge science uh, to the art of developing people. So let me start with, what was it that made you choose neuroscience? I think I've been fascinated by it since I was about 14, and I think that probably came about just by being a teenager and observing humans and thinking, God, they're quite a curious species, really, aren't they? And trying to work out exactly what was going on. And studying the teenage population is probably the most challenging group to start with. But I I started just reading. And at the time, there was this tiny bookshelf in my local Waterstones. It was very small, but there were the likes of Stephen Pinker there and great thinkers that are their lessons are still with us today. But it was definitely an emerging field. And I'd also root around in the quantum physics and, and see the parallels that were starting to be drawn out there that I think are still being explored. But it's it's just a fascination with humans. I've always been interested in how we work and then as I went off to med school, the the fascination continued and I sort of dove into lots of the training that, that you could do and sort of traveling around the world and working with medical schools globally to talk about, well, how do we, how do we enhance our um, human side and how do we treat our patients in an even better way that's not even covered on the medical school curriculum? And it was, it was just, you know, constant exploration. I was a very curious person, I think. And Amy, from there, after studying neuroscience, what interested you in about applying this in the context of developing people? I think that was through observing my dad. (laughs) So um, he ran a law firm for many years and he didn't talk that much about his work, but he would just share frustrations about how sort of he'd tell people to do stuff and they wouldn't do it. And it seemed to really surprise him. And I thought, well, yeah, that's kind of predictable, Dad. You know, actually, science tells us that just telling someone to do something is not going to lead to a better result. And so he was probably my first subject of trying to work with him, coach him to to be more effective. And, and that went pretty badly, but he's retired now, so it's all good. But it, it stimulated me to think, well, there must be other people out there that perhaps have not got access to this more advanced thinking around how we can do things. And my mum was a teacher and she She worked with kids that were typically excluded from school and her and her colleagues were doing this amazing thing. You know, they really believed in the individual potential of these kids that were growing up in horrible situations. And yet about 50 percent of them were off sick at any one time. And I just thought this can't be right. The problem is not the students like they're going to school and they're being abused and you know mentally and physically and they're okay with that it's the management that are driving them out on sick leave and i thought again this can't be right you know how are, how are the, like the managers creating a barrier between these dedicated individuals and children that really need their help so again i just uh, i didn't know anything about anything other than science really but i, I started to learn about organizations and and saw saw a gap absolutely fascinated by the link between 
neuroscience and the application of it to people, to our everyday lives. And you've written three books on how neuroscience helps people from coaching to engagement. And what are some of the most interesting discoveries that you've made along the way? I think alignment is really underrated and I'm really encouraged to hear some more organisations talking about it and paying attention to it. But I think a theme that comes up again and again is the fact that our brain is easily cognitively overloaded and in today's society the way that we work the devices the data that we're exposing ourselves to means that cognitive overload is even more easily slipped into and so the more we can do to align information messages practices ways of working the better for our people so i i found that really interesting and really easy to apply although not always easy for organizations to uh, work with but it's certainly a good principle to introduce them to and the other thing that I think is really interesting and it it aligns with ancient wisdom and with world religions but it's our attention Uh, where our attention goes is hugely impactful and I was with an organization just this morning and they were talking about how some of their senior leaders uh, were saying, oh, you know, but this stuff is obvious. Like, why are we doing this thing? It was to do with like a team meeting. And why are we why are we doing this? They Surely they know this stuff. And I thought they've missed the point completely. Of course they know this stuff, but that doesn't mean that their attention is on this stuff. You know, before they come into the office or now before they log on to the office from home, their mind is likely to have been bombarded with thousands or millions of bits of data that are irrelevant to the job that they're about to do. Therefore, by having this session and bringing people's attention back to where you need it to be, you're going to get a better result from them. I'd like to come back, if I could, just to the uh, alignment piece, because um, when you mentioned alignment, it sort of rang bells in my in my mind around within a corporate context of alignment being sort of going around lots of stakeholders and making sure everyone is aligned on the message. But I'm not sure that's the, the type of alignment you were thinking of. I think I understood it more of a sort of cognitive alignment. Can you tell us a little bit more around, around how you would you'd see alignment there, Amy? Sure. So stakeholder alignment is important, but also alignment within all of the processes and messages that an individual gets within an organization. So right from how you sell the organization before someone enters in and is employed by you, then your onboarding process, do those do even those two things line up? And then your learning provision, you know, how people are engaging with learning, how they're managed, all of these messages and these experiences tell our individuals a story and it can either enhance their ability to do their job well or it can detract from it and I think so quickly organizations hire someone with huge potential and they could do amazing things within the organization and they're this treasured this treasured hire really but so quickly trust is eroded and that person becomes disillusioned with this exciting new adventure that they thought they were embarking upon and engagement very quickly is lost. And what does neuroscience teach us about alignment uh, specifically, do you think? Our brains need simplicity to a degree or certainly if we're going to enact something we need to be clear on what we're enacting I think there's some great research around complexity and how we should deal with complexity and one of the perhaps most startling things for our intelligent workforces to come to terms with is some of the research suggests that if you've got complex decisions that you need to make stopping consciously ruminating on them is the best thing you can do to get the best decision and studies have shown this time and time again so when it comes to alignment I think all of the input needs to be feeding in an intentional direction and this intentionality is something that we often miss in organizations there can be so many scattered messages or desires and the senior teams have got to do their bit to really pull everything together. And don't get me wrong, some organizations do it amazingly and 
you know, it's really clear and it's so refreshing. But a lot of the time, there's just constant transition and change and confusion. And as you know, we're fascinated by curiosity as well. What have you discovered in your research about curiosity in neuroscience? Curiosity is incredible. And I was so excited to hear about you guys writing this book that's out there, because it's something that links so many desirable outputs together. I'm frequently telling people, if you can cultivate one thing, cultivate curiosity. I think there are different aspects to curiosity. You've got research around trait curiosity versus state curiosity. We lean towards state curiosity because I think you've got some more flexibility around it. But even there, years ago, we started Uh, mapping out some different skills that have got neural correlates and one summary that we came up with there were there were four in what we call the homegrown brain and how you can develop your brain but one we called the curiosity seeker and this is someone who goes beyond the status quo it's someone who has courage and enthusiasm and the curiosity to explore and discover to go where other people won't and it's someone who can then capitalize on opportunities which require them to think and act outside of their brain's comfort zone and it just it links to a whole range of different skills so your ability to inspire and motivate others with motivation requires your curiosity if you're going to um, be driven to achieve results that are overcoming the status quo you need curiosity and even another you know big chunk of curiosity big type of curiosity is around social curiosity and if you're going to build good relationships then you need curiosity again so a lot of the desired skill sets that we look to our leaders to demonstrate all have got an underpinning of curiosity so yeah i think it's critical We've been seeing that curiosity is becoming a lot more topical today, uh, and we hear a lot more about curiosity today. What, what do you think it is, Amy, that is making it so topical at the moment? I think it's a couple of things. So there is a growing recognition that it's needed for all desirable things. And even if the recognition isn't there that links everything up, organizations, individuals are seeing for their thing, whatever's on their priority at the moment, they go, oh, curiosity could help this. And that's absolutely the case. I think that personality has been linked to a wide range of adaptive behaviours, including tolerance of anxiety, uncertainty, emotional expressiveness, um, initiation of human playfulness, conventional thinking, non-defensive, non-critical attitudes. All of these are linked to curiosity. So we've got a real evidence-based building that says, curiosity is fantastic and it is absolutely something that you should be cultivating and I think this goes hand in hand with recognition that many education systems in the world ours in the UK certainly included stamps on it (laughs) it's heartbreaking but actually based on the way things are organized in a lot of schools and priorities are handed down to them and pressures are put on them If a child raises a question, there's no time for any exploration and that's causing problems. So I think it's coming at it from different angles. It's fascinating, Amy, because uh, what we're seeing, um, and I'm sure you are in organisations, that they're becoming more focused on curiosity or a growth mindset. They're really starting to see the tangible business benefits um, of investing in curiosity. So why do you think it's so important for organizations to nurture this? I would actually, as a side point, I'd separate out growth mindset from curiosity, but I I can see how it's getting linked together. I think now a lot of desire is being placed on self-directed learners. And this was pre-COVID, but it is certainly ramped up a lot as a result of COVID. But having self-directed learners, people that are are inquisitive and are wanting to develop themselves and have got all of the skills that link to an attitude and state of curiosity is is becoming desirable. So of course, we're going to start to see, well, thankfully, I shouldn't say of course, thankfully, we are starting to see organisations invest in ways to develop curiosity. And coming back to our earlier point around alignment, in order to do this well, it's going to have to speak to different 
departments and different sets of policies and different sets of procedures. So the organizations that are going to do it really well and succeed in this are going to make sure that everything lines up. So it's not just, say, L&D saying, hey, curiosity is good, be curious. But actually, the KPIs are completely distinct and in no way linked. And then when we onboard people, it's very much just lecture, 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 lecture. Um, So hopefully we're going to see this lining up. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. And you mentioned the, the, uh, that in your mind there's a distinction between curiosity and a growth mindset, and uh, I think you know, we would agree. In fact, what, how would you characterize that? What would, how would you describe a uh, growth mindset? In organizations, how's that different or complementary to curiosity? So for me, a growth mindset is the is the mindset that is the summary of what naturally goes on in all of our brains. So we've got neuroplasticity occurring, which is the natural property of the brain to change. And someone that's got a growth mindset is aligning their mindset and their beliefs with the reality, the biological reality that a brain can and does change, which I'd say is separate from curiosity, which is more the living, breathing, dynamic expression of feeding this brain that can grow and develop but how would you define it differently yeah i think i think we would we would absolutely agree i think we would say that having a growth mindset is linked very much to confidence and confidence is a big part of your ability to be curious uh, we found that the confidence and curiosity were effectively two sides of the same coin without confidence without a growth mindset it's difficult to be curious but as you are more curious so you become more confident and so you you become uh, more comfortable with having a growth mindset. That's so true. It It's a privilege in many ways to be able to be curious, isn't it? And again, you see it in children as, as with adults when that confidence isn't there. They've not been given permission to be curious and that's not been nurtured. It's been squeezed out or limited in different ways. That's right. I I came across an amazing piece of research the other day about kids from underprivileged backgrounds when exposed to curiosity or growth mindset type approaches to learning benefit unbelievably more than kids from uh, more privileged backgrounds because it opens a door to a a bigger world and a wider world and seems to have a huge impact on on their understanding of context and the, their expression and the opportunities that they suddenly see f- that they have in front of them. So, you know, it's, it's amazing what we're learning about curiosity in education. I was wondering, from a neuroscientist's point of view, do you have a, a kind of formal uh, definition of curiosity? I would, I would colloquially and informally describe curiosity as being interest with a sparkle. So I think you, I think you feel there's an energy about someone that's curious rather than, than just interested or there's something that's, I I don't think we fully understand it yet. And, uh, you know, I'm probably marginalized, but I think that there's much more to come in the alignment of quantum physics research and neuroscience. And there's there's a few pioneers that are very credible in what they're saying and thinking. But I but I believe that curiosity is going to en- encompass more of that thing that we don't see and that that quality that we don't yet fully understand. But I think there's something almost magical about curiosity. Mm. You've, uh, you've piqued my interest with uh with a quantum uh, Mine too. piece, Amy. You've got to give us at least one thing perhaps that you've learned or you've read that, that's around the connection between curiosity and and quantum science. I don't know that this is anything I've read. This is probably just the, the, the general appreciation of us as quantum beings, which again, I'll say is not mainstream. There are some, there are some great people championing the exploration, but even when you look at what we do know about how we work, we know that there's 
a layer to our reality that is not observable by the naked eye or it's it's measurable by certain metrics but it's not it's not something we normally talk about and it's not something that we're normally aware of but there's that missing piece quite often in situations and in things that we're we're seeking to understand more of and that missing piece we don't know exactly how it works yet but there is we know that there is a quantum reality to our lives you know to the the microphone that's in front of me it is both a solid object but it's also got quantum properties when we get down to the the very small level and i i think there's something energetic we know the energy we certainly know that energy exists that's been around our awareness for a long time but there's the way that we infect others you know we know that emotions are infectious that they have an effect on others that they're contagious and that's something like emotions um and there's there's lots of examples in nature where um, there's connection across a distance and i just um i i may be completely wrong but i feel like uh, curiosity it has a similar kind of underpinning to it do you think it's possible we can measure curiosity? Do you think there are things we could look at that indicate that curiosity is present, both in an individual perhaps or even in an organization? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there'll be um, neural markers that we can identify and then correlate with people. There's behavioral markers. I think in the future we're going to utilize a lot more wearable technology which will aid in identifying different states. There's great research already going on that looks at the synchronizing of brain waves in different situations and different states. And if we take curiosity through the lens of a state, then it would be conceivable that we could identify whether say a leader walks into a room and through their curiosity and their uh, engagement and their interest they they generate and raise the level of curiosity in the room just by the questions that they ask and the way that they listen so yeah i think they're really exciting things to come and I mean, moving from curiosity in individuals to curiosity in organizations. So I know you work with a lot of large global organizations. And do you see a difference between them in their level of curiosity? And, and if so, what does that look like? Yeah, it's uh, quite disheartening at times. <laughs> I'm sure you see it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the easy examples to look at is people's approach to learning, because you would hope that in the learning and development departments of organization, you'd got some curious people in there. And uh, I'm sure they are on one level. But in some organizations, as, as an external provider, what we can sometimes find is you say, okay, what do you want to do? And they say, we need a workshop, we need a workshop on, you know, same resilience, we need a workshop on resilience, because over the summer, everyone needed a workshop on resilience. Okay, what, what are you actually trying to, to do? Well, to, to put on a workshop on resilience. Yeah, but what, <laughs> what, what are you actually looking to achieve with your people? And I know this is alien to you, Simon, but trust me, there are people out there like this. Um, and you say, you say, okay, well, just, you know, might there be another way that we could achieve this result that might be, you know, more long lasting, or have a bigger, deeper impact, or, you know, might work with how the brain works more. So, you know, we break up the learning and we space it and we get people to um, engage and interact. No, we we just need the workshop and and that can be so disheartening because you think oh guys um you're only you're capping what you can do with your people and that's mm. sad but others are the other end of the spectrum and we we work with amazing companies that are just so open and curious and honest and recognize that perhaps not everything is possible right now but they're really keen to build new messages in and we've uh, like we love it when the senior leaders get on board with being curious about how brains work and then they're asking those questions and then it does feed into everything that's being done it's a case of putting the brain on the agenda and i think that's fantastic from a leadership perspective a curious culture is a game changer what does curiosity mean for you Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. Workshops and, and bringing people together in the past we know has a huge impact. And 
you know, two, three, four day workshops when people are focused on something, you get a level of synchronicity that starts to um, engage between people and we become aligned and we have to become aware of, um, be careful of groupthink and so on. But we know that we kind of start to resonate in the same way. And the thing about digital and lockdown and COVID is it's been forcing us to tr see if those things are possible online, which which is a fascinating topic for me. I like the things you're saying. It really makes me reflect on how we can take those things we take for granted when we're together and put them into the organization as a as just a matter of course, that that's the way that organizations become curious organizations full of curious people moving things forward. It's really making me reflect on that kind of shift of the kind of energy we get when we're together to the energy that we can generate now that we're more digital and also the energies we can create by putting uh, infrastructure into the, into the organizations that allow us to achieve those things. I think that's a real challenge, Garrick, and I think it's it's right that all organisations are reflecting on that at the moment and being intentional and proactive rather than just stumbling into it. And I know everyone's had to just stumble initially, but we're encouraged that now people are starting to ask better quality questions and revert to the drawing board a little to go, OK, look, we're here where we are, but if we were going to design it now, how would we do it differently? I was wondering what other insights from your books can we adopt to create organizations that work better? What we've seen in the real world work really well is when the senior leaders get it. And by get it, I mean get that their people have brains, that they are human beings. And what we've been starting to talk a lot about, which seems to have gained a lot of traction in, in some organizations, is around intentionally creating high-performing neural environments. So remembering and honoring that actually these humans, in order for them to produce at a high level, in order for them to do everything that will create your strategic vision, their brains need to be in a good condition. And there is a neural underpinning to a lot of the different outputs that we're looking for. And as I say, get it on the agenda, actually get a column in whatever you're doing that says, and what kind of high performing neural environment do we need in order for our people to produce this? And I think as people are switching on to this and starting to have these conversations, decisions become much easier because actually the brain's got a view, as it were, in terms of how it will work best for you. And previously, no one asked it. No one turned to the neuroscience research and said, OK, and what do we need to create the environment for the brain? They talk about all of the stuff that is normal. You know, what are we going to pay people? What are we going to train them in? All of the rest of it. But there's that there's been that missing piece that we've got the science to inform us on, but it needs to actually be appearing on the agenda and attention needs to be given to it and then the insights need implementing. So you, you're going to have to reveal to us what a high performance neural environment looks like and how, how do we build one? It's a term we're using to summarize the multiple different environments that you need depending on the output that you're looking for. So there's not one single high performing neural environment just as there wouldn't be um, one uh, set of behaviors that will lead to a particular result. It depends on the result mm -hmm. you're looking for. So you have to articulate the result first, then you articulate the behaviors that are going to lead to that result. And then there's a corresponding high performing neural environment, depending on what those behaviors look like. I, I sort of colloquially think of it as the, the neural blueprint. So what's the brain looking like when we're getting the person to do X, Y, Z? And I know in your last book, Engaged, so you also covered how we can make work more enjoyable, um, which coincidentally was talking with a, our team yesterday around how do we make learning effective, efficient and enjoyable. So that resonates. Uh, so it's, I think in the current climate as well with, with COVID, this is probably more relevant than ever. So are there more things that organisations can do to make work enjoyable that we're not doing today? I think some organizations are doing what I'm about to say exceptionally well and others are off the chart backwards on this front um, and that's to connect people to their contribution. So one of the biggest positive influences 
is to have people connecting to the bigger contribution that they're making on a regular basis. We train leaders in it. It's one of their biggest responsibilities. Same for managers. They need to be doing this on like a weekly basis. And the benefits are that it activates the dopaminergic reward system in the brain. So activates dopamine, which is a key reinforcer of behaviors. So if someone's doing something that's good and you want them to keep doing it, then you want dopamine to be released. So it conditions that repeated behavior. If you've isolated the behavior well, then you'll also get the repeated behavior, which will um, start building into a habit. You'll increase the myelination of the neuronal neurons within that pathway. So it's all really good, positive stuff. Um, And practically all the leaders, the managers need to be doing is helping people see the links between the daily tasks that they're doing and the big positive impact that they're having. And for many organizations, you exist for a purpose and you're doing a really good thing in the world, you know, most of you. But do your people feel that on a daily basis? Are they connected to that? Do they get up on Monday morning thinking, I get to go to work for whoever? And feel proud and when they do get together with their friends on zoom do they are they able to say you know oh yeah no this is what I was doing this week and I feel really good about it and that's where their attention's going it's not on the minutiae of the challenge and the difficulties and the frustrations actually they're connected more to this big picture that makes them feel good and that really resonates with um, what we see within Novartis. So the the strong cultural link with inspired, curious and unbossed and the inspired element around that being very much how do we at an individual level connect with the, the purpose um, of, of extending and improving patients' lives. So that, that very much does resonate. Well, I said, Simon, not all of this is going to be relevant for you. You're a tiny <laughs> example. <laughs> oh, there's plenty we have to learn as well. <laughs> Amy, it's been brilliant chatting with you. If we if we had one more question we could ask you, um, maybe at a very practical individual level, um, what tips do you have for people to become more curious? I think for you, what is something that interests you or what could interest you? So if there was anything that you could learn more about or get more skilled at or anything and maybe go back to your childhood that's often a good place to go because there's something that that sparks and that sticks with us as kids and then just commit to touching base with it in some small way it can be really small but if there's something that's got that ignition that can light a fire within us and that we can start to just then enact it really builds the habits of fueling our curiosity and exploring further so yeah find something small that you can do but that links to something that lights you up so great advice there so have a think what it is that makes you curious and uh, how you can commit to it to uh, to create that fire thank you so much for joining us amy it's a real pleasure lovely to chat thank you for listening to the curious advantage podcast The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. Subscribe to the podcast today. Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.